The Italian America Show is sponsored by Full Sponsorship, Cento Fine Foods, Trust Your Family with Our Family, The Bianchi Law Group, a team of former prosecutors who handle criminal matters, domestic violence, and municipal court throughout the state of New Jersey, Dr. K, the management professor and author of Rockstar Manager, From Theory to Practice. The authors of the number one international best-selling cookbook, Don't Cut the Basil, Five Generations of Authentic Italian Recipes. Dr. Mark D'Annunzio, National Fourth Vice President, Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. The Grand Lodge of New York. The Grand Lodge of Delaware. The Grand Lodge of Ohio. The Grand Lodge of Virginia. The Grand Lodge of Rhode Island. The Grand Lodge of Maryland. The Grand Lodge of the Northwest, representing Oregon and Washington. Long Shot Productions, get back in the game. ACMT, excellence in aerospace manufacturing. And by Silver Spring Capital. Silver Spring Capital Wealth Management is a proud and longtime supporter of the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. Welcome to the Italian America Show. I am your moderator, editor in chief of Italian America Magazine. Miles Ryan Fisher, and with me, I have two very wonderful hosts, Mark D'Annunzio, who is our national fourth vice president of the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy and America, and the lovely Lisa Marie Falvo, who is our media liaison. And today, we have a very special guest, the founder of Paychex. So some of you may recognize his company because some of you may get your, your income through his company. And he also owned the Buffalo Sabres for those hockey and sports fans out there. He recently released a book, The Italian Kid Did It, which we'll get to in this episode. Um, the, the wonderful Tom Golisano. Thank you for joining us, Tom. My pleasure, Miles. Absolutely happy to do it. We're so pleased to have you here uh, for the rebranded, renewed Italian America show. So obviously on the show, we celebrate our Italian heritage and pride. So let's start off with that. Tell us a little bit about your Italian background and lineage. Okay, sure. Uh, Bob was born in the United States, in upstate New York. My father was born in Sicily, came over when he was 11 years old with his mom. His older siblings, of which he had five, all came before him one at a time. And then my father was the last one to come over. Notice uh, there was no father at the time. My grandfather, my father's father, worked in a sulfur mine in Sicily and died in a cave-in just before my father was born. So my father came over to the United States um, <clears throat> with his mother by himself. Uh, they moved to Rochester, New York where two other of the siblings went to. The other three siblings moved to uh, California. So I had three uncles in, in California and two here in Rochester plus my dad. Uh, and that was our Italian heritage. My mom was born again, I said, in Leroy, New York in upstate New York. Uh, I was the youngest of three. I have a sister that's uh, now, I won't say her age, I'll just say she's 13 years older than I am. And I just turned 80. So you can figure that out. Uh, I did have a brother who was killed in the Korean War, one of our misfortunes, uh, who was 11 years older than me, and then myself, which was sort of an afterthought because I was the youngest by 11 years. Uh, did you go back and forth to your hometown in Sicily at all? Uh, I had been there three or four times. I, when I was at the courthouse trying to track down my relatives, the woman in charge said to me, you know, the address that shows for your family is just right down the street from the courthouse. I said, really? So she gave us the address and uh, we walked down there and it was an apartment building. The windows like were like a foot by a foot, They're very small windows in the building, but and their apartment was like on the third floor. 
it was next to a playground, which helped a lot. But that's where the family grew up, and that's where uh, you know we started from. What was the what's the town name? Uh, Cantonacetta, the city right in the center of Sicily, Cantonacetta. Very nice, it. very nice. Well, I am half Sicilian myself, so oh, is that it's right? me a fellow Sicilian. <laughs> Mark, what do you have? Yes, uh, Tom, we were talking about Italian heritage. Uh, please tell us how your Italian heritage helped you become a success. Well, you know, uh, Mark, it probably was a plus and it was probably a minus. The ways I'll start with the positive side. Uh, obviously, it probably was a little easier to sell Italian companies by service uh, because I was <laughs> Italian. So that, that definitely was a help. Uh, on the negative side, though, growing up in the 50s as a teenager and then going into the workforce in the 60s, uh, being Italian wasn't exactly the most popular thing. And I was in a business that was a lot of people didn't know a lot about, but they assumed it had something to do with the mafia, the mob, you know, so I had to deal with that in, in, uh, in the early days. Uh, and it took quite a while to get rid of that uh, potential or perceived image. Uh, but it did, but it took it into the 80s and 90s before people realized I was a very legitimate person. And it probably had something to do with the fact that we became a public company in the early 80s and had, had uh, you know, a very successful uh, uh, period of time. So, so it so, was negative and it yeah. was a positive. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that, you know, even to this day, you know, some people still have that. Um, you know, that unfortunate stereotype against Italians. I know that people like yourself, though, have really worked hard to buck that with all of your wild success. And you talk about your company that went public in the 80s. Talk to us how that all came to be. Where did the idea for the company come from? And how did you scale it to such epic proportions? Sure. I'm glad to tell that story anytime. <laughs> I started Paychex in 1971 all by myself with one other employee. Uh, and our goal in life was to sell payroll services to small companies, one to 50 employees, which was a marketplace in the payroll processing world nobody was interested in uh, besides ourselves. So we kind of really broke ground there. But I did it on a shoestring. When I started the company, I had $3,000 in my bank account, and that's it. And I used it for direct mail the, the week I started. I was hoping from this direct mail campaign to sell 60 clients. Well, I sold six. <laughs> so from that point on, for about a four-year period, it was really touch and go. Uh, I went four years without a paycheck myself. Fortunately, my wife, Gloria, at the time, uh, took out a, a job, employment, and she helped, quite frankly. I also had some friends that were very good to me. They used to take me to lunch. They used to take us to dinner and so forth. They knew things were tough. But after four years and getting about 300 clients, uh, it became apparent that we were going to be somewhat successful. But at that point, I decided to get some other people involved in the company. Some people I had worked with or played baseball with or had some association with. And I got them interested in paychecks and ended up with 17 of them that moved from Rochester, New York to other parts of the country to start a similar operation, paychecks. And we did that over a four or five year period. It was a lot of fun. It was like operating a fraternity. You know, we used to go to nice places and celebrate our, our accomplishments and all that type of thing. But then we decided to get, we had to get serious and we combined ourselves into one company. Before we were 18 different companies, we combined ourselves into one company in the late seventies and with a goal in mind to become a public company or I'll sell the company if there was a buyer that was interested. Uh, four and a half years went by and we decided we were going to become a public company. And we did that in 1983. Uh, when we reached that level, the market value of our company when we went public was $65 million, which, you know, back in 1983, that was significant. Today, our market capital capitalization, our market value is $44 billion. So if you were a shareholder in paychecks in the early days and hung on to it, you probably did pretty well. What is your role with the company today? Well, as of 2004, I was the CEO and chairman. In 2004, I resigned and retired as CEO, stayed on as chairman until a month ago 
<laughs> where when I, when I hit my magic birthday, I decided that uh, maybe I should step down as chairman of the board and turn it over to another individual, which I have done. So now I'm still a board member, but I'm just not the chairman anymore. What's the secret to my famous margarita pizza? Fresh basil, fresh mozzarella, and cento. People ask my wife, what's the secret to your bolognese? A little of this, a pinch of that, and cento. Grandma passed on two family secrets. Saute, don't fry, and, and always cook with cento. <laughs> it's no secret that the best tasting dishes use cento. San Marzano tomatoes imported from Italy, with nothing added, just authentic flavor for authentic Italian cooking. Cento, trust your family with our family. The Commission for Social Justice, CSJ, is the anti-defamation and positive image arm of the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. The CSJ conducts campaigns at both community and national levels that support cultural and social issues of importance to Italian Americans, including the preservation of Columbus Day and his legacy. For more information on the CSJ or to donate, contact us today. So, you know, it, within your journey in paychecks, I mean, you got into owning a sports team, which is so exciting. I, for me, I'm a big sports fan. And the fact that you bought a, a major league team right where you grew up in the area that you grew up, Rochester, Buffalo. Uh, talk about how the Sabres came to be. Well, first, you have to understand, I was not a hockey fan. I had seen three National Hockey League games before I bought the Sabres. The reason I got involved is, of course, the team at the time was bankrupt. And there was a danger of them leaving Buffalo and going to some other place. Well, that bothered me. Even though I wasn't a hockey fan, I said, well, maybe I can go in and help this community, which, like you said, was only right down the street, and see if we can't save this team. And uh, after some process with the National Hockey League and, and some other individuals that might have been interested, I ended up buying the team. Uh, when we bought the team, we had 5,500 season ticket holders. And I can tell you that's a losing proposition. Uh, the team was not doing well economically. Obviously, it was in bankruptcy. Within a year, we had the season ticket sales up to 16,000, and we had a winning team. And for the duration of the years that I owned it, we never had a losing season. And we absolutely won the uh, President's Cup one year, which was the best record of all 30 teams. So from a uh, enjoyment, entertainment, sports point of view, I think we did a really good job. Uh, we ended up selling the team. Uh, an individual came along who was really wanted the team. We were very assured he would keep it in Buffalo, which is the number one concern of ours. So we sold the team to a gentleman by the name of Terry Pagula. Uh, and Terry's, in my opinion, a good owner. He hasn't had the, as good a results as he wants, but he's trying and that uh, we wish him well. Tell me what the motivation was to write a second book. Well, maybe I should ask you what the motivation was to write the first book, <laughs> okay. because they're, tied, they're actually tied together. I started writing the, the second book, the autobiography, and got about six chapters done and decided to show it to a uh, publisher. So I showed it to the publishers and they look, took a look at it. And one of them called me up and says, Tom, he says, you ought to write a business book first instead of an autobiography. So while we're talking on the phone, I said, gee, could I do that? And I started making a uh, table of contents, uh, you know, sort of a listing of what I would say in a business book. And when we finished with the phone conversation, I kind of liked the idea. So I went to work right away on writing the business book. And of course that came out uh, last year, just before last year. Now it was time to do the autobiography, which uh, we finished several months ago. And now that has come out. Two years, two books, any plans for the next book? What? <laughs> uh, no, unless I want to make a list of all the mistakes I made <laughs> in writing these well, books. That would, that would be helpful to everybody else because then you, that's where you learn, right? I mean, as an entrepreneur, you have to, you're going to make mistakes, but the, the important thing is you get up, obviously, from your mistakes and, and carry on and don't make the same mistake twice, I guess. Well, that's what I was trying to accomplish was the business book to just alert people about some of the pitfalls of running a business, some of the things that you can do, uh, not do well at, and some of the things you can improve at. 
And uh, it's been very well accepted. A number of universities and colleges have put it into their entrepreneurship programs, which I'm very, very happy and proud of. I am enjoying <laughs> this book a lot. I know you're here to talk about your book. The Italian Kid Did It by Tom Golisano. I'm recommending it to anyone who's watching this interview and everyone who's not watching this interview. Um, well, thank you. It's a really wonderful, you have really wonderful anecdotes that touch on all sorts of emotions. You'll make readers laugh, but you'll also make readers feel pain. And one poignant thing in the book that I, I, I want you to talk about seems to have shaped you as a person. Um, and that was something you witnessed with your father being dressed down. Um, and I, I felt I felt it as you were talking about it. And I'm sure that doesn't compare to what you felt experiencing it. And I think it was a wonderful anecdote to share and a wonderful life lesson. And it led you on a certain path for a certain reason. And, and I was hoping you would speak a little bit on that. Sure, I'd be glad to. I was, uh, I think, a junior in high school. I was working with my father, who was a salesperson for a macaroni company, local company in Rochester, New York. And his role was to sell to the smaller stores, not the big supermarkets, but the smaller stores, uh, the product line. And he had to deliver most of the product himself, and he uh, drove a big panel truck. Now, my dad was in his middle 60s at the time, and it was a tough job for him. So I used to go along with him sometimes in the summertime and help him carry the boxes in and all that type of thing. Well, one day we went to the corporate office uh, for whatever reason, and the owner of the company tore into my dad uh, very strongly about something that happened. I really can't tell you what it was that happened, but obviously he came down very hard on my father right in front of me. And of course, my father was very difficult for him to defend himself. It felt so bad that I was standing there listening to this. And, you know, we, we left the office. We didn't talk all day long. It just bothered us so badly. But I made a couple of decisions because of that. The first decision I made was, if I ever was in a position of management, managing people, I would never treat anybody that way to, to uh, you know, to give them such bad input in front of so many people, which there were a lot of people in the room when it happened. You just, you don't do that type of thing. The second thing is it inspired me. I said, if I have the opportunity to have my own business, that's where I want to be. I don't ever want to be in this position. So taking those two things out with that experience has had a very important impact on my life. And I'm glad you appreciated the story. I love the title of the book. What, what made you, what inspired you to land on that being the title? Well, you know, I, I did, I was the one that came up with the title. I'll, I'll take credit for it. And I'll tell you why. Something happened when I was a teenager. I was living in a middle-class white suburban town. And across the street was a gentleman that owned a car dealership. And one Friday afternoon, obviously somebody came by his house and took one of his cars out of his driveway and took it for a joyride. Well, I wasn't home at the time. I didn't know anything about it. But Saturday morning, uh, two policemen showed up at my house. And my father said to me, they want to talk to you outside. So I went outside and I said, you know, what's going on? He says, well, the guy across the street, somebody took his car for a joyride last night. He said it was you, the Italian kid. Fortunately. Fortunately, I had a very ironclad alibi. <laughs> I was at a friend's house and their mom and dad was home and they verified the fact that I was there all night or, you know, all during the time. But, you know, the Italian kid did it. So I thought it would be a good play on words with Italian kid did it on the negative and maybe on the positive side. What's the secret to my famous margarita pizza? Fresh basil, fresh mozzarella, and cento. People ask my wife, what's the secret to your bolognese? A little of this, a pinch of that, and cento. Grandma passed on two family secrets. Saute, don't fry, and, and always cook with cento. <laughs> it's no secret that the best tasting dishes use cento. San Marzano tomatoes imported from Italy, with nothing added, just authentic flavor for authentic Italian cooking. Cento, trust your family with our family. 
The Sons of Italy Foundation is the philanthropic arm of the Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. It was founded in 1959 with the purpose of preserving Italian-American culture, encouraging educational excellence among Italian-Americans, and assisting in other areas such as veterans' causes and disaster relief. To date, the Sons of Italy Foundation has given tens of millions of dollars to these efforts. For more information on the Foundation or to donate, contact us today. So two books in two years. Talk about what the writing process was for you. How involved were you? And, you know, what was the big takeaway you took from that? Because that was such a different thing for you. Yeah. Uh, I hired a, a, a writer to help me. Uh, his name is Mike Wicks. He's from uh, Vancouver, Canada. And Mike had a knack that people, a lot of people have said to me, he has a knack of extrapolating my verbiage and putting into book form in a way that it, make it makes it sound like me actually saying the words. And uh, to me, that's a big hit because I, I, you know, I wanted it to be my words and I wanted people to feel like it was me talking. Uh, and he just did a super job of it. And what we would do, we'd sit down and say, okay, we're starting chapter one, here's some of the things we might want to cover. And he would start interviewing me and then asking me questions. And of course he recorded everything that we said. And then he said, okay, Tom, I'll see you in a couple of days. And I'd come back in a couple of days to see him. You need to have a chapter written. And we'd go over that chapter line by line. I was fortunate enough to have a good friend helping me with it, Steve Pigeon. Uh, Steve has a much better memory than I do. And he came to every one of our sessions and helped me with, uh, actually for both books. Uh, but Mike had a genuine quality of being able to make this sound like me talking. And uh, he did. That's great. I wanna just switch gears a little bit because with all of your success in really everything you've done, I know that giving back is so important to you. Can you talk about your charity efforts throughout your career? Uh, yes, I'd be glad to I'd try to be a little humble about it because, uh, but uh, we started a family foundation in the late 20s, I'm sorry, the late 80s. And it was designed to help organizations that work with developmentally disabled people. I have a son who's developmentally disabled. And uh, so it seemed like a very natural thing to do. Well, over the years, we've given millions and millions of dollars in grants to organizations that help serve that population. Uh, and also outside of that, uh, one of the areas I'm very happy with my philanthropy is we have three children's hospitals that have been named after our family. Uh, one in Rochester, one in Syracuse, New York, and one in Fort Myers, Florida. And nothing has been more rewarding to me than having my name on those hospitals because I, go, I can't go a week with somebody calling me up or seeing me on the street or telephoning me and saying, Tom, they were wonderful to my child, to my grandchild, whatever. And uh, we're so thankful. Thank you very much. I mean, so what could be more pleasing and satisfying than hearing that? What advice would you give to the, uh, to the youth of today? Well, I think the youth of advice that our youth advice I would like to give today is very simply, there are so many new frontiers for business opportunities that exist today that nobody should be discouraged in thinking about starting their own business. As a matter of fact, we're going through a period of time uh, right, right now where new business startups in the United States are about the highest they've ever been. Uh, you know, a lot of it had to do with COVID, of course, and people wanting to stay home, and come up with a different idea. But the opportunities for business development is huge today. And a lot of it has to do obviously with uh, uh, the changing of the population more going towards uh, uh, the uh, end of the war people. Uh, and now with all the technology that's going on, just tremendous opportunities. So stay faithful, go after it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, before we wrap, Miles, do you have anything? Um, I have something, and this will be, we, we talked about this before we got on the show. Um, I'm a second baseman on the baseball <laughs> field. And this is, this is where um, Tom 
just won me over completely, and I became a fan favorite of his. When he told a story, and this is an anecdote that will be a, a positive, enjoyable anecdote to share. Um, I, I was hoping that you would share um, the anecdote that you had in the Italian kid about the second baseman on your team that got cleared out and then how you responded to that on your high school baseball field. I was in the outfield when this happened and uh, our player was at first base. Uh, we were up to bat and somebody hit a ground ball. I'm sorry, the other team was was on up to bat and their second baseman was on first base. And I'm in the outfield. And somebody hit a ground ball to the shortstop who threw the ball to the second baseman. The runner from the other team came in very hard with his feet up with, you know, in those days we wore spikes. And it it looked nasty from where I was standing. So I took, you know, I saw that and I said to myself, hmm, I wonder if I'll ever get in a situation to give that back. And sure enough, within the next inning or two, I was on first base. The next batter hit a ground ball to the shortstop. And I went into second base. I mean, I didn't even think about sliding. I just went in hard because I wanted to pay back, I guess, if you want to call it that. And there was a bit of a tussle, and they broke up the tussle. And uh, But after that, thankfully, we became good friends, and uh, we're still very good friends today. That's kind of the, the I mean, you stuck up for your teammate, which was the number one thing. But the, the, the outcome of you becoming friends with that team second baseman is just one of the right. most beautiful ends to that story. And I think that that's, those are the kind of stories that I've enjoyed in your book and that I know everybody is going to enjoy in your book. Um, there, there is a lot to enjoy about it. There's a lot to learn from it. And that goes for anybody of any age, um, you know, from, from youth, all the way through. Um, and I hope people check it out. The Italian Kid by Tom Golisano. They'll enjoy it as much as I have in the middle of the night with my dog on the couch. Um, I've really taken a lot of pleasure in reading and I'm looking forward to, to finishing it up soon. Thanks, Miles. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun writing and I hope people do enjoy it. So Tom, we want to thank you for being a very special guest, and we hope that everybody enjoyed this episode of Italian America Show, and that you go out and buy The Italian Kid Did It by Tom Golisano. You're going to enjoy every single word that he has to say in it. And I want to thank Mark and Lisa for being wonderful co-hosts, and we hope that you tune in next week when we have another special guest for The Italian America Show. Thanks a lot. For more information on Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America and how to join, please visit osaya.org. Please also follow us on social media. The Italian America Show is sponsored by Full Sponsorship, Cento Fine Foods, Trust Your Family with Our Family, The Bianchi Law Group, a team of former prosecutors who handle criminal matters domestic violence, and municipal court throughout the state of New Jersey. Dr. K, the management professor and author of Rockstar Manager, From Theory to Practice. The authors of the number one international best-selling cookbook, Don't Cut the Basil, Five Generations of Authentic Italian Recipes. Dr. Mark D'Annunzio, National Fourth Vice President, Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. The Grand Lodge of New York. The Grand Lodge of Delaware. The Grand Lodge of Ohio. The Grand Lodge of Virginia. The Grand Lodge of Rhode Island. The Grand Lodge of Maryland. The Grand Lodge of the Northwest, representing Oregon and Washington. Long Shot Productions, get back in the game. ACMT, excellence in aerospace manufacturing. And by Silver Spring Capital. Silver Spring Capital Wealth Management is a proud and longtime supporter of the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America.